Hey guys, Pastor Jurgen here. I'm so glad you're tuning into one of our powerful messages that is guaranteed to absolutely elevate your life to another level. At Awaken, we only want to preach fresh, real, powerful to help you grow stronger in your walk with God, develop your faith so you can take more territory. I'm praying that God blesses you and enriches your soul as you listen to this amazing word from God. God bless you. So what inspired my uh, message today after conference, I started reading into this Bonhoeffer book. I didn't even feel saved. So if you ever just feel like you're just getting, you need to humble yourself, read Bonhoeffer. Great book. Some of you don't know who he was. He's a pastor, a martyr, a prophet, and a spy. And Eric Taxis, who uh, preached in this campus, in this church, wrote this book. Just a, just a small book. Just a small book. Uh, But it inspired me to really, you know, press into what this message was today. And I was praying about it even during conference because I knew I was preaching this Sunday. And by the way, all my Italian friends, God bless you. They had to find Wi-Fi in the middle of Italy. They got the thumbs up and now they're watching it. Hopefully we have a skinny filter on. And I'm gonna preach this way because this side's better. Yep. What? I miss my people, yeah. miss my people. Um, but really what, what I was praying about was what is the difference? And I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, oh, you just need hearing aids. I'm like, hearing aids? I don't need hearing aids, my hearing's fine. He goes, no, your church, make sure they have hearing aids. Didn't even know what that meant. But as I pressed into it and I really started listening to what the Holy Spirit was speaking to me, it was creating the difference between committed Christians and interested Christians. See, my wife doesn't want me to be interested in our marriage. She wants me to be committed to my marriage. If you're an employer, you want to find people that are committed to work for you, not interested. And it's funny because we can be the type of church that we can raise up and disciple interested Christians, or we can raise up and disciple committed Christians. Why do we do the things that we do? Why do we have DNA? Why do we go full throttle at men's prayer, at women's prayer? Because we're committed to discipling Christians that when the wind comes and the storms comes, we don't fold like a deck chair. So then as I pressed in, I realized the hearing aids were from the verse, hmm, Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You know, what was interesting when I always started, I need to kind of laugh a lot. You know, when when you're like in a, I just need some funny things to happen in my life. And I was kind of just, I love Jay Leno, and I was watching his show on cars, because how many know Jay Leno's the total car guy? Yeah. And so if you just want to geek out over awesome cars, follow Jay Leno. I mean, I moved to Escondido, and I went down on accidentally on a Friday night to Grand. I'm looking at these cars going, oh, dear Lord, I, I must have got raptured. I'm in heaven. <laughs> this is amazing. You know, I just like, oh, some old thoughts, you know, pre-saved thoughts come up. All right, I think I could steal that car. I could hotwire that Cobra for sure. How far could I get before I get jailed? Hmm. But then I got, you know, renewed my mind. That thought went ahead. You know, it was all good, but just honest thoughts. But I was listening to this Jay Leno thing, and he did this thing. It was so funny because I was watching these videos, and the next thing it showed him on a show, and he was doing that man on the street thing. Do you may remember when Jay Leno was man on the street? He'd interview people. So he was interviewing some people, and, and I was like, oh, I wonder what this is about. And it says, how much do they know about the Bible? I'm like, oh, now I got to watch this. Yeah. I was like, you know, I saw it was like an eight minute clip. I'm like, I'll just watch the first minute. How many of you know after this one, he's, he runs into these two young people and he said, hey, can you name one of the 10 commandments to this, to this woman? And I go, oh, dear Lord, I can already see where this is going. She goes, oh yeah, absolutely. She said, the first one, oh, I don't know what number it is, but I know it's one of the top 10. It's uh, freedom of speech. Yes. <laughs> and I was like, Oh, okay. So he looked to the other woman. He said, complete this sentence. Let he who is out sin, and then fill in the blank. Her response was, have a good time. (laughs) Hmm. Let he who is without sin have a good time. That's interesting. It's like the opposite. Okay, we're playing opposite Bible. Okay, so then then he goes on to this next. Now you know you're committed to the full eight minutes. You know, I'm not going to cut this thing off. I'm getting good material. So then he's going on. He finally finds this young man, maybe in his 20s. He goes, all right, according to the Bible, who was eaten by a whale? 
And I'm telling you, the certainty on this young man's face, I mean, like, he, he knew. Yeah. Like, he was raised in theology. Yeah. That's easy. Pinocchio. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking to myself, oh, my gosh. This wasn't like a foreign country. This was the Bible Belt of America. And the first thing I did, a lot of you want to know now behind the scenes of the pastor, the first thing I did, I started panicking. Please don't tell me they're from San Diego and that interview wasn't done in San Marcos. Where are those people located? It better not be from my church. Here's what I learned. All right, we are preaching the gospel today and I'm gonna give you all my phone number, 510. No, I'm not. But if you ever get in that situation, plead the fifth or read your word which is what we're gonna talk about today because faith is important. And this book right here is the most important book we can start reading, get on the inside of us. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. I realize post-conference, man, it's July. Interesting facts. July is the month that splits the year in half. And that's probably more importantly because I don't know why my boy Maverick the other day asked me what New Year's resolutions were and we're in the middle of the year. So then I got really convicted knowing, oh, junk, what are my New Year's resolutions? So I had to go back and, I mean, you all know you write them down, January. Some of you forget them by the third. Some of you made it till the 10th and you Navy SEALs up in here, you made it to the 30th, you know what I mean? But we're talking halfway through the year is July. July actually third this year, or was it second? July 2nd was exactly split time and half between the years. So we're halfway through. My question is, how's your New Year's resolution? So when my son asked me, I then had to explain it. And then, you know, like every good seven-year-old does, he goes, dad, what was yours? <laughs> oh, shoot. And I said, well, it's actually to make your mother as happy as I can all year. And I was like, got a smile. And then, of course, what's Maverick do? Mom, what's yours? <laughs> it's to make sure your dad keeps his. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yep. in deep trouble. So I'm now going to put a sticker on my bathroom window today and remind myself that's my New Year's resolution, which made me think of my other one, especially after the 4th of July. How many know you just gain weight after the 4th? Sure. Yeah. You suck it in and you do everything you can to look good in that bathing suit for the 4th, but you're eating the entire weekend. <laughs> and when they extend that day to like a Monday, you've been eating Friday, yeah, yeah, yeah. Saturday, yeah. Sunday, Monday, by Tuesday... Yeah. I go up in there, I'm like looking at my other New Year's resolution, which was all I did was hashtag river ready. (laughs) Which if you're a whale, that would have made sense, but I'm getting up on the scale and I just happen to be up on the scale and I just kind of, and my wife, I hear her look at me with, you know that look? You know, every every wife has a look. She gave me that look and like pretty much said with her eyes, do you think that really makes a difference? So I said, duh, yeah, it does, because I wouldn't be able to see the scale. (laughs) So I've really been convicted on New Year's resolutions this year. And uh, one of the other ones was, regardless whether I made those other two or not, I agreed I was going to make it through my daily, yearly reading. And I will tell you, it is the most important But I thought like, man, how important is, if we're gonna preach today, how many wanna make sure we end strong 2022? Who's with me? Doesn't matter how you start, but it does matter how you finish. And I said to myself, man, what every area of my life, if I'm gonna improve it, I'm gonna improve it if I'm in this. This is, surprise, surprise, all wrapped up into this book are the instructions for your financial life. These are instructions to better your marriage. These are the instructions to better your business, better your life, better your relationships. Whatever you need better in is gonna be a direct correlation to how do we get in this thing. How we get in this thing matters. What we're gonna do with it. If you want a better version of yourself, the more the word that we get on the inside of us, the better results we're gonna have. See, it's amazing because so many people get focused on the wrong things. Now, this book has been amazing. There's been a lot of information in here. So this book will give me a lot of information. This book will get me a lot of transformation. If you want transformation, this book, 
if you want information, this book. This book is inspiring me, but it's making me more hungry to get this book in me. And I'm gonna explain why. You know, there's, uh, I have four points today. The title of my message obviously is Hearing Aids because you're not gonna forget that. Yeah, thank you. But here's what I wanna know. This is the four points. We need to know it, stow it, sow it, and show it. Thank you, thank you. Lyrical gangster. That's a big deal. Have you ever sat down and thought about what are your points gonna be? No, okay. If I, now you know how my brain works. Just wanted to give you a little rhyme. So while we're doing that little rhyme, because I want us to know it, stow it, sow it. Thank you. Picking up what I'm putting down. So faith comes by hearing. It was interesting, and we're gonna read out of Romans in just a minute, but here's, here's what I looked at. Faith is translated from the Greek word pistis, which means belief, trust, or confidence in someone or something. What's amazing, faith is the key to the entire book of Romans. Wow, right. So when I was really looking this up and doing a study on this, I'm like, wow, over 40 times in this book alone, they talked about faith. And of those occurrences appearing in chapter 10, there is three specific right in chapter 10, the verse I'm gonna read from. The verb from the word is also used 21 times within the book. Verb is the action. So some of us are gonna take action. 21 times in this book, it's most often translated into believe. So your faith or believe is important according to the word that you're hearing. It's amazing how many Christians that I've met that their belief muscle is small that their faith muscle, the number one thing I get on IG that someone sends me, I mean appropriate thing that someone sends me, <laughs> dear Lord, we need a filter, yeah. is they ask me, how can I hear from God? Wow. How can I increase my faith? Those are the two things that I get most on the DMs on IG. How can I hear from God? And how do I increase my faith? Romans 10, eight through 17 says this, and read it with me. In fact, it says, the message is very close at hand. It is on your lips and in your heart. Somebody say heart. Heart. It's what we're gonna be talking about. And that message is the very message about faith that we preach. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, someone say heart, heart, that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart, there it is again, that you are made right with God, and it is by openly declaring your faith that you are saved. As the scripture tells us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But how can they call on him to save them unless they believe in him? And how can they believe in him if they've never heard about him? And how can they hear about him unless someone tells them? And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That is why the scripture says, how beautiful are the feet of the messengers who bring good news. But not everyone welcomes the good news. For Isaiah the prophet said, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes by hearing, that is, hearing the good news about Christ. We're gonna get in. So point number one, the word of God must be heard, which is know it. Why? It increases your faith. That's right. yeah, yeah. It increases your faith. As we go into crazier times, guess what? How many you know you're gonna need more faith? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, some of you. I promise you in the next couple months, you're gonna need a lot of faith until about November 3rd. Then we should be good. I'm serious. Romans 10, 14 declares, how should they believe in him who have not heard? Proverbs 29, 18, where there is no vision or revelation, the people perish. But he who keeps the law, he is blessed. I'm telling you, if we know it, Romans 10, 17 says this, it declares that faith is the result of hearing God speak through the word of God. The word of God produces faith in the matter of salvation. How can we give our heart? And it kept saying heart, heart, heart. This is a heart thing. I don't care what people think because you cannot believe something until it's in your heart. It's like my declaration of faith. You can think all day long positive thoughts, 
but until you declare them and have a confession, when you go from declaration to confession, you go from mind to heart. We're 18 inches away from sometimes our breakthrough. Salvation is sometimes 18 inches away. Relationships, you never hear that phrase, drop the penny? I just say, hey man, we're 18 inches from breakthrough. Get out of your head, get into your heart. The Bible talks about it, guarding your heart. But when the heart is transformed, your life will be transformed. First Corinthians 1 Corinthians 1.17 says this, for Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the, cro- uh, the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Philippians 2.16 says this, holding forth the word of life that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. See, the word of God produces faith in the matter of growth. If you wanna see growth in your life, we gotta get the word in our life. It's amazing what a word deficient society we have, but if you go around and take the, take the Barna study, how many people are Christians, yet the next Barna study, it was like 90% of all Americans, you know, are, say, Christians, but only 60% own a Bible. I love Dwight L. Moody. I grew up, my dad would always, you know, the Moody Institute. He would always quote me something from the Moody Institute. And I used to think it was ridiculous until I'm preaching. Now I love the Moody Institute. What did D.L. Moody say? Well, let me tell you what he said. He said, I prayed for faith and thought that someday faith would come down and strike me like lightning. But faith did not seem to come. One day, I read in the 10th chapter of Romans, now faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I closed my Bible and prayed for faith. I now opened my Bible and began to study and faith has been growing ever since. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished until all works. Every Christian, we need to own and have a Bible. If you don't have one, see my stack of Bibles over there? Look how good that stack looks. If you can't see it, I know. (laughs) Right there. And afterwards, if you don't have one, come get one. You said, man, I got a neighbor I'm praying for. Come get one from a neighbor. It caused me some problems. I want the headquarters on Tuesday to go, hey, Dr. Matt, someone stole all your Bibles. Nope. Come on. I'm making sure we equip the saints. Like, if we're going to war, I'm never going to say, hey, put, all, put on the full armor, leave your swords and guns. No. Take them all. Full armor. That's your armor. That's your weapon right there. We want to know it, read it, own it, and deliver it to as many people as possible. I love this. 2 Timothy 2.15 says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needs not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I love this, our 28th president. Interesting fact, he was our first two-term Democrat ever as US president. You ready to hear what he says about the Bible? Two-term Democrat. I am sorry for men who do not read the Bible every day. I wonder why they deprive themselves of the strength and the pleasure Woodrow Wilson, 1921. Listen, that's why we pray. That's why we're involved in politics. That's why we pray for the righteous in every seated area of power. Because if we don't have a church that gets involved and prays for righteousness, we will lose California. We will lose the country that was founded on biblical godly principles. And it's got to stir something on the inside of you. For us to be silenced, that's not what the word of God says. Some of you don't know how to say that, but that's okay. Acts 17, 11, it says, these were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Can't even say that. And they were received the word with all the readiness of mind and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. See, I love it because I don't want us to get caught up in the books of information and miss out on the transformation that God's calling us to says, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. But what you're renewing it with matters. How you renew it, who you renew it with, it matters. When you hear or read God's word, you must constantly be saying to yourself, is God talking to me or is he talking about me? Is he talking to me or is he talking about me? 
How do you read the Bible? Number two, the word of God must be believed and received. This is how we stow it. You got to believe it after you receive it. Hebrews, uh, Hebrews, I could say that. That's why I know God loves coffee. Or microbrew. Because he wrote Hebrews. I know, bad dad jokes. But it's been one of those weekends. Still dehydrated. It was 124 in Yuma, people. Pray for your pastor. I was like, Psh. It says for this, for the word of God is alive. In the New King James Version, it says living. For the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and to the joints and marrow. And it is the discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. It's amazing because my first 30 years, I realized I would get in the Bible or read the Bible, especially when I was in college, if I wanted to go to sleep. If I needed to go to sleep quick, it was always Levitical law. But I just would be like, man, I need to go to sleep. And it was funny, my default was I'll just read the Bible. That was my first 30 years. See, I don't think I understood it as a live and powerful, a weapon. I could have read that and be like, oh yeah, sure, it sounds like a weapon, I could throw it at somebody. <laughs> but see, I wasn't operating in the Holy Spirit and the Bible wasn't alive to me. Wow. It wasn't until I met someone like Pastor Jurgen who prayed for me, took the scales off my eyes, realized, man, I was a lukewarm fake Christian that probably wrote on my parents' coattails, that probably, if I had to be honest with you, accepted Jesus to make sure just in case there is an eternity, I'll be in it. Wow. Sure. But my revelation wasn't that I was a warrior meant for the kingdom. My revelation was that this wasn't alive, this was just information. Sure. My revelation was this wasn't really just transformation. I didn't have any of those res revelations until I met Pastor Jurgen and saw what a life on fire, committed, not interested in the Christian walk, not saying I'm a Christian, but actually living that I was a Christian. And then when I saw my first deliverance, I'm like, man, I think I need some weapons. Oh my gosh, that was real. You know, when I started to see and I saw my friend in the hospital get totally healed, I realized, where did he get that power? You know where he got that power? Right here, because he lived a life transformed. So because of that, I said, I need to start taking this more serious. When I got prayed for, when I got filled with the Holy Spirit and I opened the word of God, I would look at the words on the page and they would jump out. I would see things and have revelation. See, before I was only studying the word and it was logos, it's what God said. But when I was alive in my spirit, I realized rhema is what the Lord is saying. This is a logos word and it's a rhema word depending on where your heart's at. How bad do you want that rhema word? How many need fresh revelation today on decisions in front of you? How do I handle my marriage? Handle out on my kids? Do I take my kids out of this school? Do I put them over here? Do I take this job here? Do I just trust this person here? How do I go into business with this person? Do you want a rhema word or do you just want to sit down there and be really smart? And I love what you said, Jamin. We could be like the rich run ruler and do all things on our own strength or we could have a revelation because God wants to get transformation through his word. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 says, and we also thank God continually because when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as a human word, but it actually is the word of God, which is indeed at work in you who believe, not who you who think you're smart, those that believe, which takes faith to believe. Romans is such a good book. We have to exercise that faith. I love this because I was reading years back Lee Strobel who wrote the book Case for Christ. So those that have all these kind of like things, he was a researcher, he was a, an attorney, he was a journalist. So he was reading Case for Christ. He wrote the book Case for Christ, but he was inspired by this judge, Sam and Chase, in, from 1873. Well, this guy was one of our first judges in America. Get this, this is what this judge Salmon said uh, back in the day. There came a time in my life when I doubted the divinity of the scriptures and I resolved as a lawyer and a judge, I would try the book as I would try anything in the courtroom, taking evidence for and against. It was a long, serious, and profound study and using the same principles of evidence in this religious matter as I always do in secular matters. I have come to the decision that the Bible is a supernatural book, that it comes from God, and that the only safety for the human race is to follow its teachings. 
Lee Strobel was so inspired that, by that, he went and did his own journey. It was amazing that Lee Strobel just didn't wanna go on this guy. He had to go do it on himself. I'm like, man, I don't have time for that. If Lee's good, I'm good. <laughs> I love this. The Bible was not given to increase our knowledge, but to change our lives. Colossians 3.16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Psalm 119.11 says, the word I've hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. If you got the word on the inside of you, it's gonna help you stand upright in a fallen word. Number three, the word of God must be shared, sow it. Mark 16.15 and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Right. In Romans 10, just in verse 14, it says, how then shall they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him who they've not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Listen, we all got feet to go out and preach the gospel. Sometimes you don't even have to use words. People are watching. People are watching. You know, it was amazing because one time, uh, you know, we were actually just at the river. And this lady came up to us, was talking to us, and not to put you guys on the spot, but it was really about you, Kat and Jason. And she came up and she goes, I have been trying to get them to church for like 10 years. I love them. <laughs> And she was talking to my wife just how important they have a couple they were and how amazing they were. I've been trying. And then they found out that they were on fire for Jesus going to our church. But here's, let me tell you, a point of encouragement. She's been planting seeds yeah, yeah. that whole time. Yeah. Wow. And other friends water them. They say sometimes it's like seven seeds. But here's the thing. We're out at a sandbar and they want to come have a conversation about how they see the fruit of someone's life and how fired they are up in the spirit. We could have been talking about anything. Yeah. But they want to talk about somebody they saw transformation in that they've been praying for for 10 years and it's radical to see that. See, people are watching and we don't even know. What you do in this life echoes in eternity. It's quoting my favorite movie, but the word of God must be shared. And it was one night in my revelation, I was just thinking about this. I was walking to a hospital. Someone asked me to come pray for them in a hospital. And you know, with all the crazy things. I'm running through that hallway in the hospital because I'm not, no one's telling me to put something on. I'm just walking through that. Like, just give me that room. I'm going to lay hands on them. Bam. Let's get out of here. You know, drop it like it's hot and run. Watch that person get healed. But as I'm going down the hallway, all of a sudden this guy busts out of the room and runs up to me, hugs me. Cause I was like, Oh my gosh, what is this guy doing? And, and he just started yelling, she's going to make it. She's going to make it. Wow. Hugs me, grabs me, tells me, and then he was so passionate about it. And here's the deal. I didn't know him yeah. and I've never seen him since. Yeah. But my revelation was apparently it was somebody near and dear to him and he just received good news. Yeah. And actually such good news, he ran out of the room and the first person he saw, he didn't care what he had to do. He had to share the good news. The revelation I had on that, he didn't even have to know me yeah. to share it. Yeah. He just wanted me to put a yes and amen to it or hug him back, which I did. But it just flowed from him because he had received that good news and the good news had to be shared. But how many Christians know the good news but walk around like a Sour Patch Kid on their face and no one wants to hug them? But how important is that if you know the good news that you have the joy that you're sharing that good news? Now, I've never thrown a Bible at somebody. I've never wanted to say, you need a Bible. You know, it's no condemnation, but live a life that is such the light. People go, what is that guy on? Acts 4.20 says this, for we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. What have you seen and heard? Yeah. See, what happens is when I was, well, I still am, still a chiropractor, but my brother had a radical experience with chiropractic that changed my entire family's dynamic, changed our lives. So when I have people, I don't care. I'd go to Kobe Swamp. When I was first in practice, I didn't care. If there was people, I was there. If you're alive in a spine, I'd be there. <laughs> Changing minds and aligning spines. And I'll wrap that all day long. Okay, so I'd be at Kobe swap meet. And I'd be like, hey, who's your Cairo? And you'd have people like, I don't need a Cairo. 
You know, I don't believe in that mystery stuff. I was like, whatever. All right, next, next. Some will, some won't. Who cares who's next? Let's go, bring it. I would be just be preaching my gospel of how everyone needed to be on my tables. And I'm telling you, I was so convicted about that because it saved my brother's life that I was full throttle everywhere. I wanted everyone to know the good news that I had. And I didn't care. I didn't take it personal. They made fun of me. I had people say this. I want to argue. But I was so passionate about it. I knew all the research. I knew all the studies. I knew all the data. I'd smoke anybody. It was like to the point where I felt sorry for somebody that would actually want to have an intellectual conversation about it. So it was this confidence on the inside of me, but I was so passionate about it. I studied it learned it and owned it. Yep. It was amazing one day after I got spirit filled, after I was having the revelation, God said to me, if you're so passionate about this, why aren't you that passionate for my word? Why aren't you that passionate to see people in eternity? Sure, you can help them heal in this life, but where are they going after? And it messed me up. I remember I wept, I called Pastor Yuri and I said, man, I had a revelation. Whatever you need, I'm here to sow. And I just said, whatever you need, I'm your armor bearer. Whatever you need. Someone doesn't show up, I'll go do that. I was sold out going, man, how can I be so temporal and passionate about something? Because it impacted my life, but yet it's because I didn't understand the value of the gospel, the value of what Jesus did in my life. But once that penny dropped and it went right here, I said, whatever it takes. And that same passion that I had for learning my profession, I said, I'm gonna take everything I did and I'm gonna start learning this. I don't want to sit here and argue scripture. I don't want to do it. I just want to, it's a smoke show. You put out your hands. Let me pray for you. I'll call down fire right now. You want to see what power looks like? Listen, some people need to see a deliverance to get something shaken on the inside of you. Some of you need to have your best friend in the hospital, the kidney's failing, they're going to remove his kidneys. You need to see God come down and get healed for you to rattle you. Once I started seeing the power of the almighty God, this is transformation. What are we doing? What are we doing? Once you have the penny drop, all that other stuff, it's probably gonna save you money downtown. It's true. I was wasting money on things I didn't like to impress people I didn't really know. But once I had that revelation, it's like, I'd rather build the kingdom, sponsor kids for junior high camp. I'd rather build the kingdom, so in. I'd rather go make more money and have an extra car and give it to a mom in need. It's like, whatever it takes, not to be boastful, but once your purpose shifts, your life shifts. This is the only thing that can transform your mind. And if we're not in it, how's it gonna transform anything? And this isn't judgment, but once it's alive and powerful and shaping your life and you start to see power in your life, you'll be addicted to it. It's the only thing we don't need to get you delivered from is the word of God. I got to get you delivered into it. I'm going to end with this story because I thought it was fascinating. I love history. And just recently there was this article on this man that uh, he had passed away. And uh, he had very few comforts in his home. However, they did find 246 exquisite violins that he's been collecting his whole life. He was passionate about violins. What's insane about that is they're all crammed into his attic. But in his very devotion to the violin, he robbed the world of all that music. A guy that, um, you know, because he didn't have kids or anything, it just everything was about these violins that no one got to hear from for years, like 60, 70 years. And the guy that went to the auction, he bought the whole lot of them. And what I found interesting that one of them had been silent for 147 years, this violin. It was worth $1.5 million in 1998. Now it's worth 9.8 million. This guy that bought them all looks for passionate pursuers of the violin. He gifts some of them away. He sells some of them. But the one thing he makes them all sign that this violin will never be shelved or never be silent again. He goes, these violins that were created to make a beautiful sound can never be silent again. And he sews them into people that are committed into the violin, not interested. I thought it was an interesting revelation how many Christians treat Christ like that man treated some violins. They come to church, they get a Bible, they maybe put it on a shelf and they never crack it. 
It's the very love of God's grace that we understand it's good news that will give you the zeal that you need in your life. But see, everyone was designed for God, by God. The Imago Dei were created in his image, in his likeness, to do radical things, not play it safe, not to play small, radical things. You don't have to be hype man. We already got JD. (laughs) But there is something special and unique on the inside of you that the only way to unlock it is right here. See, the enemy, it's amazing. The enemy is gonna do whatever it takes. See, I set up meetings with attorneys. I set up meetings with other doctors. I have coaching clients. It's amazing how I don't miss those meetings. They're high value, you know what I mean? But I've made a commitment to be in my word every day. It's amazing how many times I could just miss those meetings. But once I had that revelation, like what the heck? The devil is a deceiver. The devil is a liar. The devil wants to do everything he can to make sure you don't crack this. Because if you crack this, he can't contain you. If you crack this and get one revelation from heaven, he can't stop you. If you have a dream that becomes a destiny, that becomes a purpose, that gets you driven like you've never been driven before, he can't slow you down. He doesn't want you. He'll do everything he can to keep you out of this. He'll do everything he can like, man, please, I don't need them at that church again. Let me try to get them offended so they don't go back. Let me try to get them checked out so they don't go back. I want to make sure they don't get a Bible. I want to make sure like, okay, they raised their hand, but man, don't don't get empowered. Make it an interested commitment, not a serious commitment. Listen, we have DNA for a reason, to empower you. We have connect groups. We have discipleship programs. We have men's prayer. We have women's prayer. Whatever it takes to get you dipped, that you become so hungry, this becomes your GPS. This becomes your pen drop. That when people go, where are you at? They just, you drop a pen. I'm right here in the word. Let's get a revelation together. We could teach together. We could do things together. Make it fun. Don't get so religious. Jesus did everything around the table. Yes, he had wine there. And by the way, that was his first miracle. So stop trying to turn it back to water. That is a word for somebody. The word of God must be lived. Show it. The value of the Bible isn't knowing it. It's obeying it. Knowing the Bible is a little bit of it unless you practice it. How do we show it? James 1, but the doers of the word, not just hearers only, deceiving yourselves. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said to them, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. Spiritual maturity comes not by education, but by obedience of being in the word of God. I'm telling you something. Don't let the devil get you out of this. Don't let the devil try to keep your eyes off getting the revelation of what God's trying to do for you. I wanna be a mature church. The greatest thing that ever happened in this last season, he took all the lukewarm Christians out of our church. I'm telling you, it was kind of crazy to watch, but then you know what he filled it with? A bunch of lions and lionesses that are hungry. They roll up in here. It's amazing. My conversations around the convention, I used to have to tell people and walk them through like men's prayer stuff. Now they're like, put me in coach. I'll lay hands right now on people. Whoa, whoa. Man, we used to see like, hey, if you need a miracle, raise your hand. You'd see about 10% of the room. Now you're getting 50% of the room. Now you're watching people get out of their seat, getting uncomfortable, walking over, laying hands on someone they've never known to share the good news because they've witnessed and encountered Jesus in a real way because I can tell they've been in the Word. We have more people going through the yearly reading than we've ever had. Whatever it takes. But let's be doers of the word. The best thing to do with the Bible is to know it in your mind, stow it in your heart, sow it in the world, and show it in your life. I'm gonna say it one more time because I want us just to punch the devil in the face today. If you want the Bible, you gotta know it in your mind, stow it in your heart, sow it in the world, and show it in your life. You don't have to be perfect. I don't need a bunch of Christianese perfect people. I need you to be real. If you can't let the mask off and come down for prayer at the altar because you're going through something, what are we're a hospital helping broken people get healed. But once you're healed, we're gonna get you in the word of God and then disciple you to go out and make disciples. 
See, in the Bible, it never says anything about raising your hand. How many people raise their hand today in church? Show me in the Bible where it says that. It says, no, make disciples. How do you make disciples? You get them in the word of God. You might come in rough, but we are committed to your healing, committed to your breakthrough, committed, committed to your learning, committed to supporting you, and committed to kicking the devil off your back. And then your commitment is, go be a Paul to a Timothy and teach them how to do the same. Our nation needs more of you than ever preaching the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus. Let's make sure it's working in our own life first. So if we could all stand to our feet, I wanna pray for us this morning. Come on. Don't be shell-shocked today. How many of you are getting in the word? I got my Bibles down here ready for you. So I'm gonna pray for all of us. And then if you need a Bible, you come and get a Bible. If you need prayer, I'm gonna have my ministry team come forward and just come get one. One drop from heaven can change everything. Everything, look at evaluate. How are my finances? Are they a nine or 10 on the scale of 10? Are they a nine or 10? Okay, I don't need prayer for money, I'm good. Okay, how's my marriage on a scale of nine to 10? How are my kids? Are they up there at nine to 10? How's my job, nine to 10? Like, listen, let's level up our lives. We have the Seber wagon, it's called Jesus. And as he gives you the revelation, let's live and bear the fruit of what God wants us in our life. Press down, shake it together, overflowing. 10, 30, 60, 90, whatever that is in your life, how do you want to live it? Heavenly Father, God, I thank you. God, I thank you for your revelation today. God, we know we're not perfect. Only Jesus was. And thank you that he died for us so he could take our sin. Thank you, Lord, that we get an attaboy, that you give us a mulligan on the daily. But God, we don't want to always take those mulligans. We want to live in revelation. So God, I thank you for transformation of our hearts. Thank you today for transformation of our minds. God, thank you for what you're renewing in our lives. Thank you, God, for healing our heart. God, I thank you that we will be the church that loves those that are lost to bring them in, to find the good news of Jesus, God, that we will show them where the door is so they can open it. Let us be the best doormen and the doorwomen in the industry that we can lead people to the house of the Lord, that they can have an encounter with you, Jesus. God, I thank you for your favor over our life. God, I thank you for breakthrough in every area of our life. God, I thank you that, God, we can walk in a supernatural transformation that other people will see and ask the questions of what's his name. Today, we speak Jesus. God, we speak Jesus on the daily. I thank you. And everybody said, amen. Wow. What an amazing word. I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. Hey, listen, for more information about our church, go to www.awakenchurch.com or subscribe to our YouTube channel if you haven't already and download our app. It is amazing. It is chock full of incredible messages, information about upcoming events, and you can even support our ministry if you feel so inclined. We loved having you with us today. We look forward to seeing you again. God bless you. Live a life that is transformative. Bye for now.